So let's jump right into it because obviously I want to rant and I want to get this off my chest because it's annoying to see this happening year in, year out. But it seems to be the common sort of adage that keeps on happening. Whenever we get a new manager, it's usually, especially if a new manager is kind of a bit of an authoritarian, usually the guys and gals that we don't like in our team who kind of, you know, falter by the wayside and don't pull up their socks and aren't actually getting themselves involved and whatnot and stepping up to the challenge, they usually are the ones who kind of shine under these managers because then you see them, you're like, oh, as you know, if you get gas, you're like, oh, this so-and-so player just needed direction. They just need an arm around the shoulder. They just needed somebody to tell them this and that and this and that but the reality is a lot of these players in our team a lot of these players in our squad actually are just not the ones we don't have enough quality players who know really how to control the ball you kind of contrast this game with how man city played against liverpool the other day and the, the lacking quality the, it's just frightening you look at even just the other game yesterday too v Bayern munich and Borussia dortmund the levels of ball retention the levels of quality on the ball skill passing was absolutely crazy crazy to see honestly crazy to see and um yeah the only way this is going to change if we get new owners because at the moment we've got a whole squad full of players who have always been here during the Glazers you know ownership Luke Shaw being a good example who just seem to be able to get away with murder but I feel like as soon as we get new owners the demands will change the requirements will change and those players who I think have been stealing a living for the longest time will finally finally be out or they'll be kind of pressured into stepping up and fixing up. But I think the majority of them will probably have to go. Um, regarding the match itself, not really much to kind of speak about really I think for the most part Newcastle did come out on this game wanting to enact revenge it kind of seemed like they really had a bit between their teeth they knew that they probably should have won the FA Cup game that we had previously where we won and they wanted to basically demonstrate that in the league and obviously solidify their plans and their hopes of maybe finishing in the top four so for them it was a big game it's a big game for us also but for them considering they're under new ownership and they want to get into the Champions League and heading into next season it'll be a good opportunity for them to kind of you know have have that in the back pocket if they want to go sign new players they really did come into us i think really hungry worse more more so than us but as united fans always get duped we, we kind of all felt that the international break came at the greatest time especially with casemiro being out for the suspension with four game ban it kind of felt like the international break was a godsend for united because we're still involved in a lot of competitions and you'd think maybe the rest from a lot of our players would maybe do them good they could rest they could relax they could recover and then once the league starts again, you can then just maybe get a little second wind out of them because we don't have the strongest strong we don't have the strongest kind of strength in depth in terms of squad wise. But as per usual, these groups of bottlers, these absolute waste men of players that we have in our team, just don't know how to really kind of how to kind of be there for the team when the team needs them most they need encouragement they need the perfect scenarios they don't seem to respond well it just really is abject and you can go throughout the entire team but the kind of two positions i kind of want to highlight this kind of you know goes back to saying where i think in general united fans know better than most people is maybe luke Shaw and scott mctominay Scott McTominay during the weekend or during the international break scored a brace against Spain and pretty much played the best game I've ever seen him play ever in his life. Um, when he played for Scotland, he played basically as an attacking uh, midfielder who was bursting into the box. He was running onto chances, finishing them with a plump in the box. Just looked assured, looked incredible, right? As an attacking midfielder playing in that number eight, number 10 type of role for Scotland against Spain, who are in transition, don't get me wrong, but Spain are still a top quality, top, top quality team. So M Tom, Scott McTominay does this against flipping, what's it called? He does this against Spain. And the whole fan base gets gassed. The whole fan base gets excited. We think, oh my God, Scott McTominay's back. Scott McTominay is this. Scott McTominay is that. We don't need Casemiro. Scott McTominay's going to do the job. And then Scott McTominay gets rewarded and gets to play against Newcastle away from home. And all the things that we know Scott McTominay to be, which is basically scared to get on the ball, his touches, you know, I think were really low in terms of being a midfield player. I think it was somewhere in the 30 mark in terms of how many times he touched the ball in the midfield, which is really, really low for a midfielder. He was hiding everywhere. His ball retention was abject. His passing was diabolical. There was one pass I remember in the first half where he kind of picked it up in the middle of the park and he just needs to kind of float a ball 
either over the top or around the defender to kind of give it to Anthony on the wing, who at the time was having a little bit of a good time again to Dan Byrne for the first maybe 10, 15 minutes of the game. Instead, he passes it right into the path of Dan Byrne and that gets him excited. And then he can, kind of runs onto the ball, gets into our half and they have a bit of a, you know, possession time, whatever it may be. But just really lacking in just the ability just to pass the ball to his wingers out on the wing without the defender intercepting it. Just poor quality. So the basics of being a centre midfielder doesn't have it. Um, the courage doesn't have it. So you're already having basically a minus midfielder in, in that kind of position. So essentially Sabitz is playing by himself in there. Then you have Bruno Fernandes playing in as a number six for some reason. I don't know why, why this happened, what the change was about. Maybe, you know, Eric Ten Hag saw something different or saw some holes in Newcastle style of play that he could exploit. Uh, Bruno Fernandes as, as a deep landing playmaker is pointless. That guy is proper shit. And the thing that's really annoying about Bruno Fernandes is that he thinks he is really elite. He probably thinks he's probably better than United. But I would argue that if Bruno Fernandes went to any other club who was in the top four, top three in their league or, you know, European challenging type of clubs, he'd be holding bench at a lot of these places. He'd be a squad player. He'd be someone that you'd rotate in and out. But at United, he gets a captain's armband. He doesn't ever get subbed off. And he's constantly, constantly, constantly there. And it's just annoying. I've had enough of that guy. Enough of that guy. Moving on to the other player who I want to quickly mention is obviously Luke Shaw. Luke Shaw, the club were very smart in that they gave Luke Shaw a new deal during the international break. So no one could really kind of argue about it because it came during a, maybe a good run of form. He usually plays quite well for England. So it's a bit hard to kind of get all up and bothered about. But me personally, I've been a really big critic of Luke Shaw from like from, from day zero, to be honest, because I never really thought he kind of lived up to any potential that he once had when he came to us. And for somebody that's been at the club, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you know, over 10 years, it is pretty diabolical that somebody like him who's had, I think, more average seasons than great seasons has been rewarded with a four-year contract. He doesn't deserve it. There's nothing that he deserves a four-year contract for. If anything, he's one of the players who maybe should have been having a contract on the, upon maybe approval of the new owners. Once the new owners kind of get in place, the new ownership is going to go through before the start of next season. And then, you know, we've got the summer window there. Then Eric Ten Hag can decide if he wanted to give Luke Shaw a new deal. But this stinks of the Glazers coming in and basically trying to tie down a valuable asset to make sure that he's price or value doesn't depreciate but I don't see how any other top quality team would sign Luke Shaw to a four-year contract because I don't think Luke Shaw's playing any better than a Jar Cancelo and Jar Cancelo got loaned out by Man City I don't think Luke Shaw's better than Jar Cancelo but look at the difference in the ruthlessness that they have mid-season Man City decided to send Jar Cancelo out on loan to Bayern Munich because he's not cutting it and that's entirely changed their season but I say United we have to kind of make do with Luke Shaw and kind of suffer through his absolute absolute abject nonsense and don't get me wrong he looks fitter he looks way more lean he clearly looks like he's been working out because he's not wearing those undershirts they used to have on any more time i feel like those undershirts were usually a sign that he wasn't maybe the most comfortable in his body maybe he felt brittle maybe he felt a little bit chubby whatever it may be he just didn't look great now he definitely looks way more professional he looks way more like he's on it but still as a professional footballer should you be really be credited for looking good and for looking fit shouldn't that be the basic requirement if you're training two times a day five times a week you should be able to kind of be in top quality shape it's not really that much of a you know of a compliment to tell a football player that they, they look fit so if anything that's maybe goes to show you just how poorly he's been playing and some of the substitutions throughout the game Eric Ten Hag also needs to hold a lot this. I think the players have taken the majority of the blame but some of the substitutions were horrid I thought taking off Anthony who I don't think had a bad game but I still don't think he deserved to come off was really a mistake in my opinion especially when you consider he was the only one who was brave who was asking for the ball who was trying to challenge and take on Dan Byrne and they were having I thought a pretty good battle um, out there when you're playing on the wings I quite did I did enjoy that for the most part I did and I honestly think he's one of the only players that we have in our team who has a personality to kind of try things and be brave and take it to the opponents taking him off I thought was a big mistake but then I also thought the other big mistake which is really bizarre are was taking off two center backs and then bringing on Fred and Lindelof I think whoever it was but whoever it was who came on we end up then conceding another goal you know we end up conceding another goal when those two guys came on so clearly the substitutions didn't work and a lot needs to be kind of levied at Ericsson Hugg's feet because I can kind of see where he's coming at 
I think he came into Union United side, looked at what we were and how basically lacking in ambition that we were, how maybe devoid in, you know, risk, um, you know, how, how devoid in like courage and personality our team is. And I think the best way that he could have done to kind of rectify that in a very short space of time was to make sure we're challenging for all competitions, right? Make sure we're on, in the running for a lot of these competitions. That would have maybe allow the players an opportunity to put themselves under pressure and then he could see which players step up, which players falter and then be able to kind of, you know, plug the gaps in, you know, along the way as he, as he can go. And of course, with a challenge of windows going on but i think as the season has progressed and we've seen that maybe the best chance that we've got to solidify ourselves in the league is maybe to kind of you know finish in the top four and maybe win a domestic trophy i think he should have prioritized soon on he should have prioritized very early on what competitions were going to be the most important ones and put all those eggs in our basket into those competitions so whether it was finishing top four and winning a league tie and winning a cup whether it's one of the FA Cup, the League Cup or the Europa League should have been focused on and then just dismiss the rest of them because I don't think this team, this squad has it in them to compete in all of those competitions. It just doesn't have it. We ran out of steam in the league where there's opportunity for us to maybe challenge Arsenal for it. That faltered. Now we're faltering to finish in the top four, right? There's no guarantee that we're going to win the Europa League. There's no guarantee that we're going to be doing anything in the FA Cup. It's a really, really crazy time right now. Like we're in a bit of a weird one because I feel like as these losses progress, especially away from home, it's kind of zapping away to any confidence that we had in this team. So we're getting in a really bad position. But then I want to quickly move on again to Bruno Fernandes. I've always had a bit of an issue with the guy because I generally don't think he's as good as what he thinks he is. And I generally do think a lot of the stats around him kind of really do paper up a lot of the cracks. A lot of people just look at the stats and think this guy's quality, but really I've always come to the conclusion. I don't think he's better than, you know, the Manish of the world who used to play for Inter Milan during, you know, um, Rujoso Mourinho's spell there when he won a Champions League. I don't think he's better than that kind of player. Manish, I thought was a decent enough player, but he's not somebody you look back on in the game and think, oh, he was world class. But people put Bruno Fernandes in that category. I don't think he's even in the same category as a, as a Kevin De Bruyne. And Kevin De Bruyne isn't really having his most vintage season this season either. But he's still kind of putting up numbers for Man City and still very important. But I don't think he's even that much of a personality over there. And I just think in general, he does that thing in you know when the team is losing. He starts throwing his arms up in the air. He starts, you know, just um, gesticulating to flipping players, telling him where to go, where to put the ball. At the end of the match, after playing stinky, right, he had a stinky performance, horrendous performance, flicking the ball around the corner, trying long balls that didn't work, generally being off the pace, doing that thing where he does where he just running around like he's tired everywhere and doesn't bother want to do it. At the end of the game... When the players were going down a tunnel because they're embarrassed by the result, he starts shouting at them to go and say, you know, clap at the flipping away fans. Like, she has to do some, like, big, some big game Charlie type, type of thing, right? It's to kind of be like, oh, I'm the captain, I'm the leader, go over there and, you know, applaud the flipping away fans. And you know, that sort of stuff is only done for social media. It's only done for the top reds to make him look like he gets the club. But really and truly, what he'd done on the pitch was terrible. That him just, you know, him pointing at his teammates to tell him to go clap at the away fans doesn't hide away from the fact that he played like trash. He played like trash, absolute trash. Talking about trash, we have to talk about Trashford. Marcus Rashford was back to what we know him to be. And um, yeah, that was a really vintage, horrendous performance. Absolute zero. Um, in my opinion, no real attempts to take on the defenders. The passing was all over the place. The runs were weird. He does have that in his locker nowadays. It feels like Rashford has those things where he goes on a good run, then he kind of goes cold, then he goes good, and he kind of goes cold. He kind of reminds me of the last stages of Raheem Sterling at Man City, where you could feel like his time at that club had kind of come to an end. But if Luke Shaw is getting four-year contracts and he's been playing shit for time, there's no way we're going to get rid of Rashford anytime soon. He's probably going to get a new contract too. So I'm one of the only people who I think fan-wise who has basically written off the season. Where we finish, we finish. I don't really give a fuck. The most important thing we could do as a club is make sure that the owners, the Glazers, sell. And ideally, sell to a Middle Eastern consortium. Personally, I want us to have an ownership that is ruthless, an ownership that cares only about glory, that cares only about trophies, so that the demands on this club will get back to where they need to be again, so demands are not on the floor again. Because I feel like a lot of these clubs, all these players, sorry, are getting away with murder 
because the club is essentially built on finishing in the top four, finishing top six, um, one marquee signing here and there. It's not really built upon, hey, we need to win the league title again. We need to try and challenge for the Champions League. We need to win um, the FA Cup, you know, maybe you know two times in four years or something no it's not that we're in a different sort of league so at the moment the requirements are quite low but as soon as soon as soon as we change as soon as we change ownership we'll be back where we need to be i see someone in the chat mentioning sancho to be fair to sancho when he did come on i thought the game was really lost really devoid of confidence anyway but it doesn't look that inspiring that after his rehabilitation time that he went away from the club for whatever issues that he had he came back and he's still not starting games especially when he's not involved in the england setup you'd imagine this break would maybe make him have the ability to maybe you know jump ahead of some people and get more starts and he still doesn't look like the manager completely trusts him all you know 100 percent, or maybe he's not back to being 100 percent either so that's a real big concern and i think in general in general going forward we definitely need a change in terms of how we recruit players and what we do going forward because i still feel like the cause is really really mishmash in terms of the kind of wingers we have the type of attacking players we have type of midfielders we have like even looking at the team the fact that we got casemiro out and we're already looking so shaky that's a really big concern but then the final player i want to mention is what weghurst weghurst might be might be and he's got competition only because of somebody like an Andre Ayu. But I think Weghorst might be worse than Andre Ayu. He might be the worst striker in the league. He might be the worst striker. He might be up there with the Ayu brothers. Andre Ayu and Jordan Ayu are probably up there in terms of being like categorically the worst centre forwards I've ever seen in the league. Don't score goals. They hardly, you know, contribute to the attacking play of the team. They just seem, I don't know why clubs continue selling them because they're clearly horrible. But Wakehorse might be up there because of his size. Despite being six foot six, right, and looking like he's strong, he gets bullied off the ball super easily. He doesn't win headers. He barely scores headers. He doesn't hold up the play at all. Um, the only thing that he does allegedly is pressing. But I don't see that either because he looks very lumbersome and very slow when he runs around. He kind of reminds me of when Peter Crouch would try and press and run around the pitch. He's very laborious, very slow, very whatever. Maybe for a certain type of game, he works well, but he's terrible. He's, I don't think, in my opinion, he, and again, I hated Fellaini because I thought he was another representation of how poor we were in our recruiting that we overpaid for somebody so average. But I think Mara Fellaini is way better than Wakehorst. I'll take Fellaini now then that you didn't have wake horse up front at least with Fellaini, you know you can just hold up the pool you know you might score a screamer here and there you know you might get onto a couple of headers this guy doesn't even win headers he doesn't win headers and he's six foot six apparently he is terrible literally terrible and you have to look at the manager again for picking someone like him when you got the players that were available at the time um you know the profiles of strikers that we needed really was wake horse the one that we needed is he really any better than Martial now in terms of form-wise, in terms of threat to goal? I don't think so. So that's a real... The only thing you could say for him is that he does make himself available. He's always fit. He does give his all when he plays. But those are, you know, those are those are the prerequisites. I'm not going to give players credit for being fit and for turning up to do their jobs. That's, that's really ridiculous. But in terms of quality, this guy, Weghorst, is absolutely shocking. Legit one of the worst players I've ever seen in my entire life playing for United. Like, up front like legit especially when you can consider all the amazing strikers we've had over the years wake horse is diabolical legitimately diabolical so um yeah no surprise really um credit to you know newcastle for doing what they did in general i did enjoy um just from a stylistic point of view their second goal i thought was done and take and took them pretty well especially the kind of you know the looped cross at the back post from bruno gameras i think and then you know um what's his name um saint maxim nodding it back across the goal unselfishly for an on-running willock to come and do a diving header which again we don't see diving headers a lot too often i think stylistically diving headers are quite nice to see so it's nice so you know credit to willock for doing that so second goal was definitely great well deserved from them and in general they played you know they played pretty well considering you know there's not a player there's not a, lot, not a lot of players in this squad that i would have in mind personally um and again big shout out to dan burn as well the guy is what a six foot six left back um who i think had a bit of a hard time against anthony especially in the fa cup and maybe so in the first 20 minutes of the game but dan burn is like it's like that thing a lot of these players nowadays don't have 
He's just got that bit of metal about him. He's just got that bit between his teeth. He's got that mentality where he's always going to try. He's always going to put himself forward. He's always going to be brave. He's always going to take a risk. Uh, And clearly he enjoys defending. And I feel like sometimes playing in that kind of position when you're left fullback, if you get beaten a couple of times, it can probably take it out of you in terms of your confidence. It can probably make you think you don't want to get embarrassed. You don't want to get turned into a meme. You don't want to become a gif. You don't want to be put in a compilation. So you just back off from your winger and then that winger obviously gets their tail up. They start to attack you more, more space opens up and then they kind of exploit it, which can lead to goals. But I feel like Dan Byrne is always constantly, you know, getting behind his flipping winger, pushing them, giving them pressure he fouled Anthony a couple of times he fouled Rashford out there in the wing he was constantly putting in on, on people from the minute one to the 90th even when Sandra came on he was putting it on him as well so he didn't stop from one second and it must be difficult as well because he's not the fastest you know um, player out there but and it's also being the tall as he is playing against very nimble low center of gravity type of wingers it must be difficult but Dan Byrne gets a lot of kind of praise for me for just being really quality and being able to kind of um you know uh put his best foot forward and keep on defending even though you know he's playing against Anthony a player who clearly enjoys taking the piss out of fullback so big up Dan Byrne for that great performance and you know fuck us in general our next few fixtures coming up are going to be spooky the league tight the league table is looking really really crazy right now um Dash is going to get that up we're already kind of I think if if um I think if West Ham no I think if Spurs win their next game we might be fifth yeah Exactly. If Spurs win their next game, we may be fifth. So it's looking really spooky for us, especially when you consider, you know, what's happening now in the league. Newcastle got their tails up. Um, you know, most likely now, especially with Chelsea changing a manager, they may come up again. Liverpool might have a second wind. It's looking really crazy when I thought we had the fourth place sealed and done. But now it's looking like, you know, we're in a real dog battle when it comes to getting fourth place, especially considering all the other competitions we're in. So it's not going to look fun. It's not going to look healthy. Personally, I would prefer it if at this stage in time, especially with the amount of suspensions we have and the players are injured, I would really like it if Ericsson Hogg decided, hey, I'm going to take an executive decision. I'm going to focus on these competitions alone. And then sacrifices one because we can't do all of them. We can't. We don't have the squad depth. We don't have the quality. We don't have the personality. And we don't have the ownership, you know, basically. Um, that would demand that from these players anyway. So I think it's best we just focus on one or two things and see how that goes. But, you know, um, those things are easier said than done, especially when a manager trying to kind of lift up the standards. So what can you do? What can you do?